We're speaking with whom, please? Mark Johnson. With what organization? I'm the executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Our in 15 seconds, tell us about the organization. Well, it's America's oldest interfaith multicultural peace organization. We focus on social change through nonviolent uh, action. All right. And specifically, these days, what is your focus? We have three fo focuses right now. One is we have a presence in Colombia with the San Jose del Partado community, just living in solidarity as uh, unarmed uh, bodyguards. Uh, we have a delegation process that takes us to Iran. We've been there four times in the last 12 months with groups of 15 to 20 people, people to people conversations traveling through Iran. And then the third most active area is in the United States with our I Will Not Kill campaign and our Peacemaker Training Institute when we're working around counter recruitment in uh, schools and communities with young adults. What is the I Will Not Kill campaign? Well, it's a continuation of our historic work around the right to conscientious objection to war. It gives young people an appreciation for the historic uh, opportunity and the potential uh, need again to uh, create a record early in one's uh, young adult life of objection, conscientious objection to war. The I Will Not Kill campaign is a, basically to sign a, um, a commitment letter, a note saying that you would not engage in military action or uh, join the military. So would your organization call itself a pacifist organization? We are a pacifist organization, but uh, not a pacific organization. Well, we, tell me what that means. Well, it, it means that we do believe in the Gandhian principles of uh, nonviolent social action. We um, have grown also in important ways out of that intersection of Martin Luther King Jr.'s efforts in the civil rights movement and Gandhi to uh, teach people the skills of nonviolent civil action, but it is an action-oriented organization. It is focused on uh, positive social change through nonviolent action. But you said you serve as bodyguards in Colombia? Unarmed bodyguards is, a, is one of the terms. It's a track two or track three civilian diplomacy way of talking about being in solidarity, being present as foreign nationals, particularly as Americans in communities in Colombia that are threatened by that 40-year-old uh, civil war. Heavily funded in uh, ways by the American foreign aid. Colombia, you know, is the third largest recipient of U.S. foreign aid, supporting a now admittedly failed policy around drug uh, interdiction. And that process has made a number of farming communities in Colombia uh, places where there's a lot of threat. So we put people in residence in those communities. What is the United States government trying to accomplish by the support? <laughs> Good question. You tell me. Now, the, the argument, of course, is that, uh, that the Colombia had been a, uh, a source of drug traffic and that uh, the School of America's, uh, the training of military had been an effort over a really a 40-year period of conflict to contain that drug traffic and to basically, oh, there, there are words from Vietnam, but to, uh, to pacify a, a community of resistance, there are three levels of uh, military presence. There's the army, there is the paramilitary, and there is a, uh, a guerrilla uh, presence. And these three bodies will move through areas of the countryside and impact the lives of farmers and villages, the presence of a foreign population and the commitment of those peace communities in those humanitarian zones is to resist any engagement with armed uh, parties. Which side is the United States government on? Well, the United States government is supporting the Uribe uh, presidency and, and government, so in effect it's supporting the military, but the paramilitary and the military are intricately uh, interwoven of individuals moving from one to another um, s side of that three-part uh, triangle. Which side do you believe the U.S. government should be on? Well, our feeling is there doesn't there there isn't a military solution to any problem anywhere in the world, and we should be withdrawing our troops and bases from everywhere in the world. There is certainly the value of investing uh, in a humanitarian and in a civil sense aid in the social fabric and social structure of countries all around the world. What we oppose to is any aid going to the support of military. If you're 
advice were followed, what would happen to the United States' efforts to uh, reduce the drug trade? Well, I think that uh, if we invested in uh, helping to um, support an agricultural base that used uh, natural product lines in Colombia, remember we get bananas and coffee and other forms of products from there, if uh, we were more favorably and positively engaged in helping farmers and farm communities pursue those trades, then there wouldn't be uh, the need or tendency for investment in drug growth. So why isn't that what we're doing? <laughs> well, I, I think uh, historically, and there are obviously um, and there, there are others that are more fully, fully versed in the history of uh, this particular and other conflict than I, but the um, I think the historic issues is that um, U.S. corporations like Chiquita Banana no longer present in um, <laughs> Colombia and the uh, oil interest and others have there and elsewhere in the world uh, desired to preserve a status quo that was uh, the best working environment for that uh, corporate uh, presence. So, are you saying that the United States military is being used in Colombia to support Chiquita Bananas? Well, uh, that may be an oversimplification, but it's certainly the case that the militarization of Colombia and other countries around the world with the support of U.S. foreign aid does indeed provide a, um, a, a level of protection for America's corporate present, whether it be oil or commerce, that uh, yes, that is being used to, to advance a, uh, a corporate agenda, an economic agenda. So in Colombia it's bananas, in Iraq it's oil, in Iran what's our interest there? Well do we have an interest in Iran? That's a good question. Um, I don't think we do. <laughs> I mean I, our interest in Iran probably ought to be cultural and uh, educational, it ought to be a people to people exchange. So you're not concerned that we may invade Iran? Oh, I am concerned that we may invade Iran. What would lead us to invade Iran if there's no bananas there? <laughs> what would lead us to invade Iran? I think uh, probably what might lead us to invade Iran is a, an administration that has chosen a preemptive military response rather than a diplomatic response um, to engaging with people uh, in terms of resolving differences or at least growing in an understanding of one another. Certainly we are saying that the Iranian um, governments and economies intention to create an energy supply that is nuclear in character um, would, would be the rationale but uh, I mean, we're using all kinds of rationale. We use rationale around Islamic uh, revolution and fundamentalism as uh, an argument to support to, to support engagement. But uh, it's not a justifiable answer. It's not a, a legitimate reason for be having an interest there. In view of the history of this country, is there any chance? that your views of pacifism versus militarism will ever be a majority view? Yeah, I think that there, there has to be hope. I mean, that, that, that has to be what brings us together, is the, the promise and the prospect that a, a, a nonviolent uh, solution to both internal and international problems uh, will bear greater fruit. There have been a number of places in the world and a number of places in history where there has been nonviolent uh, political change, go back to again Gandhi in India uh, and the final withdrawal of the British from there. The evidence of the Philippines going through in the end a uh, relatively non-military uh, non solution. South Africa, there are a number of places in the world where people like Mandela and Gandhi and others have led um, the emergence of a commitment to a non-violent political solution through the threat of conflict. So. 
I think it could happen lots of places, especially if we sort of stepped back and uh, allowed indigenous peoples and uh, indigenous populations to resolve conflict without the support of our aid or our military uh, presence.